welcome to another edition of Academic Matters. My first guest today is Dr. Miguel Glatzer from the Department of Political Science, my home department. Miguel, welcome. Nice to be here. Um, for folks who aren't familiar with your background, would you tell them how you ended up at LaSalle, what you, where you went to school and what you studied and what your research is all about? Sure, sure. So I, I grew up in Portugal, and um, so it's perhaps not surprising that I and uh, have ended up teaching European politics here, uh, but I came to the U.S. to go to college, and I thought I would be a biology major and become a, a ranger or someone studying wildlife, and uh, I happened to take a freshman intro to political science course and got hooked, and um, from there went on to work in Chicago city government and public housing, the Chicago Housing Authority, and then graduate school, and then eventually I made my way here to LaSalle. Oh, okay. Um, you mentioned you do European politics. Mm -hmm. uh, is that where you focus primarily on, or is it broader in, in terms of international relations? Mm, I'm, uh, I write primarily on Southern Europe, um, but I've, I also work on the issue of civil society and new democracies. So there's, there's been an explosion of, of new democracies since the mid 1970s, and um, a lot of these are middle income, middle income democracies. So they're not the richest countries in the world, but they're uh, wealthy enough to have uh, states that are able to spend money in interesting ways and um, to collect taxes. Um, they're rather, they therefore, are states that can do a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've been curious to see if these new democracies follow. Uh, an older tradition of democracies as they become wealthier, spending more on, on welfare, um, on health care systems, on education, um, on labor market, mm -hmm. uh, labor market issues. Is, and I have to not get too political oh, in sure, the discussion, sure. but yep. is there a threshold with, with regard to these new democracies of, of income levels where at a certain point they're likely to succeed, whereas if they're not quite at a, a certain level of wealth, they're likely to fail or you know, become a dictatorship or, re re I guess, resort back to what they had been? Mm. Yes, there's, there's, a, um, there's a big literature on, on preconditions for democratic success. And um, these, are, these are statistical uh, studies, of course. Um, so there are always exceptions. The most famous of them is India, which has uh, all things going against it in terms of in terms of our theories of what makes democracy stable. So it has lots of different languages and lots of different religions, a lot of ethno-linguistic diversity, right. and it's poor um, to, to come to your to come to your point. So one of the general threshold levels is uh, somewhere around six thousand uh, dollars per person per year. Okay. Uh, per capita income. Per yeah. capita income, that's right, is, is often a benchmark of, okay. of uh, the once you're over that, uh, uh, chances are, are better that you'll mm -hmm. be able to remain, remain mm -hmm. stable. Yeah, and then once you're a democracy, it doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to be uh, rosy. Uh, you study in Southern Europe, and uh, that's a, a real hot spot today with regard to the Eurozone and Greece and some other numbers in that area. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of your thoughts there? It must be a hot topic in, in the courses you're teaching. Um, it is, yeah. This is one of the this is one of the biggest crises to, to have ever hit the European Union. So this is this is really a major major event, um, and a number of countries that are on the periphery of the of the core eurozone. Um, uh, European integration leaders, so Portugal, Spain, Greece, Ireland, uh, are all facing truly uh, very, very difficult situations. And so I'm, I'm part of a project that is looking at how this is transforming what these states do, how they spend, how they spend money. So um, in all of these countries, austerity has been embraced. Um, so increasing taxes and cutting spending to try to reduce these big gaping budget deficits. And um, one problem is that um, very frequently it's very hard to cut these, cut these deficits because mm -hmm. as, you, as you raise taxes and cut government spending, the economy shrinks. So you know, um, fewer jobs and, and you know, 
two of those uh, that's right things. yeah that's right how do our students uh, respond to that is it is it a concept that they can embrace how, how do you communicate that to what's largely a, a group of American students mm. who haven't traveled much uh, some haven't even gotten out of the Philadelphia area so what, what kind of challenges mm. that pose to you well when I teach European politics which I do every fall um, I make a lot of explicit comparisons to the United States and um, I, I uh, bring up Europe as the largest number of uh, the place where there's the largest number of countries in our peer group by which I mean countries that are also rich and are also democracies and um, that gets students quite quite interested because they see that the US is not the only model out there for how to be rich and democratic that there are a lot of there's a lot of very interesting variation in how you can get there and what you what you accomplish once you're rich and rich and democratic. So I find making as many comparisons to the United States as possible is okay. is very helpful. And I actually do that also in my American politics course. Um, do comparisons to Europe. Do comparisons to Europe there. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the theme of American exceptionalism is something I'm very interested in. Why is it that the U.S. is so distinctive compared to compared to other countries in its in its club? And um, I hope one day to offer a course on that very su subject. Okay, is it is it something? Sometimes it's pinned hand that American exceptionalism is uh, not is not real or it doesn't truly exist. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what what is your take on that? Is is there something? tangible to the argument of American exceptionalism? Yes, I think I think there is. Um, I think one sees it at many levels. Um, at the level of uh, public attitudes towards the state, and there's an understanding of what the, the rights and responsibilities of citizens are, what the, what the duties of the state uh, should be. Um, there I think one sees very clear evidence that Americans tend to be more suspicious of uh, giving too much power to the state um, um, the theme of American individualism, at least with respect to to political uh, attitudes and to collective solutions, I think is is um, is quite clear in the data. So Europeans tend to uh, very frequently see the state as responsible for for people's well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans are more likely to to see individuals responsible mm -hmm. for their own for their own well-being. Okay. And you, you mentioned that you do like to do a lot of comparative work, and you've actually been doing some work outside the classroom very recently, uh, taking students on a, a, a travel study group to Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about that experience. What, uh, what did the students learn? What did you hope they would learn? And um, Is it something you would do again? I'll put you on the spot. Oh, yes, yes, I'd love to do it again. Um, uh, travel, travel is one of my... One of my great loves, and um, I think one can learn a tremendous amount by observing and by talking uh, to to people. And um, the students had a fantastic time. We we um, met in Turkey with Lasallian students from Brazil and from Palestine. So in a sense, it was not just a trip to Turkey, where we spoke with Turkish uh, professors and Turkish students. Um, we also interacted a great deal with uh, Brazilians and Palestinians. And in mm -hmm. fact, the course was designed so that our Lasallian students would have as roommates um, Brazilians and or Palestinians. Yeah. Um, I, I should interrupt you and, and just tell the folks at home that, it, uh, that the Lasallian education is worldwide and that there are uh, universities related to Lasallian run by the Christian Brothers in uh, 16 or 17 different countries. There's 41 such institutions in the world. So. This was really one of the first steps in linking some schools, and this has been an ongoing project the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's a it's a great resource for for us because um, these are uh, these are educational institutions, so they're wonderful to partner with. Um, they're filled with people who are curious and knowledgeable, and uh, they're also Lasallian, and they share a lot of our values. And they're always delighted to uh, to meet with us. They, they the doors open very readily when we contact mm -hmm. other Lasallian institutions. Um, so I hope to be able to 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 build on this on this existing network. 
did you find a, uh, a common bond in, in language with regard to uh, the Brazilian students? Who yes, it was fun. That's right. It was fun to speak speak Portuguese. And uh, uh, there is a difference between Portuguese from Portugal and Portuguese from Brazilian. It's perhaps a little bit like the difference between American English and and British English. Um, but uh, uh, there's always an opportunity to, to laugh over over false cognates and um, uh, words that have slightly different meanings uh, in the different contexts. Okay. Uh, Miguel, what, uh, what are, that was last spring that you mm -hmm. went on that trip. So mm -hmm. uh, we are pulling into this semester. What are, what are the courses you're doing this semester? Is it uh, the European politics, or are you doing some other things? Um, it is the European politics and also the American politics course, the introduction to American politics, uh, and then a new course that I'm co-teaching with Heather McGee, uh, who is a um, works in Cities Classroom here, uh, but who has a PhD in philosophy. And we're teaching a course on happiness, the politics of happiness, uh, looking at the topic both from the perspective of philosophy and the humanities, and then from the modern social sciences. Okay, this tie into some of your civil society work? Or yes, it does. Work? It does actually tie into to the civil society work because one of the big findings for uh, in happiness research is that um, connections with other people and trust matter a great deal. Social trust matters a great deal, and um, uh, that income after a certain threshold doesn't really buy you much, much more in happiness. Uh, so there's a there's a interesting paradox, which is that um, in the West, people's incomes have gone up very, very substantially since World War II. Um, but the data, which we we have good data going back to um, the early 1950s, uh, suggests that people are no happier despite mm -hmm. considerably greater incomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so the course partially looks at why this might be. Okay. Well, it sounds like a great course, and good luck with it. Uh, my guest has been Dr. Miguel Glazer of the Political Science Department at LaSalle University. Please come back when, I'm, when I'll be joined by Dr. Jim Pierce, who is the chair of the biology department at LaSalle. change the skin they were born with and say they die for darker skin. Sadly, some actually do. Melanoma is the second most common cancer in teens and young adults 15 to 29. And one person dies from melanoma every hour. It's time. Change your thinking, not your skin. Stop tanning. Learn more at spotskincancer.org. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. Savings Land here with a story for you about two young spenders named Tommy and Sue. The parents let them buy whatever they chose, like video games and designer clothes. As they grew older, they spent all their pay on fancy cars, houses, two lattes a day. They lived in the moment, never saving a dime. When they tried to retire, they ran out of time. Working forever is Tom and Sue's fate, so choose to save now before it's too late. Visit our website to find out more, because a happy ending's worth saving for. They call them the golden years, and for many seniors, they are. But for too many others, retirement is like a prison. Do you have any jacks? The difference? This couple saved for their retirement. And this couple didn't. It's your choice. Choose to save. To learn how to get started, get your free Power to Choose brochure. Because your retirement can truly be your golden.
welcome back to Academic Matters. Once again, I'm Joe Marbach, the Provost at LaSalle University. In this segment, I'm joined by Dr. Jim Pierce, who is Chair and Professor of the Biology Department here at LaSalle. Jim, welcome to the program. Thank you, Joe. It's a real treat to be here. Now, and Jim, I guess it's also welcome home. You're a, a fellow yeah. classmate of mine, class of 83. That's correct, yes. So mm -hmm. I, I don't remember you in the cafeteria, but I'm sure we crossed paths many times. Right, must have, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Beyond that, tell uh, the folks at home a little bit about uh, your graduate training and uh, okay. maybe a little bit of some of your research and what brought you back here to LaSalle. Okay. So, um, I mean, the way I wound up here at LaSalle, actually, I started out as a uh, respiratory therapist. So I worked, I got my degree at um, Hahnemann University and was working here at Einstein Medical Center as a respiratory therapist doing uh, critical care, uh, respiratory care for neonates in the intensive care nursery. Okay. And I wanted to get my BS degree, so I um, enrolled at LaSalle, which was close by, and um, really had a great experience at LaSalle. It was that nurturing environment that really changed the course of my career. Uh, specifically, it was my advisor, Brother Richard Harley, the late Brother Richard, mm -hmm. who um, really um, suggested to me that I might have a career in science. And it was one of the things I never really had considered as a possibility. And he said, you know, you're good in the lab. You don't think about going to... Um, you know, uh, research, you know, get your PhD in science. And I did an internship at the Academy of Natural Sciences as a LaSalle student and then entered the PhD program in biochemistry at the Temple School of Medicine. Okay. So, um, so that's my connection to LaSalle was mm -hmm. really set me on my career path in, in many ways. Um, after that, I did a postdoctoral fellowship down at DuPont on the Human Genome Project. It was the first years of the Human Genome okay. Project. So you were in on the ground floor. Right. right. So I was an NIH fellow down there. And it was really the best of both worlds since I was a NIH fellow. I had my own funding, and yet I was in the DuPont environment, which was um, really um, very intensive in terms of the type of resources that were available, um, experimental resources, personnel, computational. Mm -hmm. I got to travel the world uh, as part of the projects that I was working on. So that was a really great, a great opportunity. Uh, and then after that, I moved into industry into a small biotech company as a genetic engineer, cloning different types of recombinant okay. peptides. So I really have a quite a diverse background from healthcare to working in a big um, yeah. uh, national uh, company to a small biotech company. Right. And then sometime as a faculty. Well, or what happened then is um, I was teaching part time as an adjunct once in a while, and I liked the business world of biotech, but I really loved teaching. And so I had to make the jump from the, the industry world back into academics. And I then became a um, assistant professor at the, used to be called the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science. Uh, they were renamed the University of Sciences. And I was there 15 years, actually, and, and climbed the ranks and actually developed their uh, bioinformatics program. Okay. So I was the founding chair of bioinformatics and computer science at the University of the Sciences. And really enjoyed that, lots of technology, working with really um, highly skilled students and, and people. Um, but I'm a biologist at heart. Okay. So when the job opened to be chair at LaSalle, I kind of jumped at that and really came back to my home and have been really happy since then. And you're, you're, just, you're ending your third year as yes, chair. exactly. So we actually come back to the university at the same time. Right, which was kind of a neat, neat yeah. coincidence. Mm -hmm. uh, for folks at home who probably heard the term bioinformatics but aren't quite sure what does it mean, could you give us a, a quick outline? Of yeah, it's, um, biology's been um, revolutionized in the past couple decades. It used to be a discovery science where you would go out and observe things and do experiments and collect data. Now we've um, rethought that approach and we go out and collect tremendous amounts of data on any subject that we're interested in and then collate that data using computer technology and then ask questions really using computer algorithms. So it's called in silico biology. So you actually do the experiments in, in a computer. And this has really revolutionized the way we think about life. In fact, even just this week, uh, the textbooks have been rewritten. Um, the a major piece of work called the ENCODE project and the Human Genome Project has just been released. Um, it's like 500 scientists from 32 different countries and labs all working to try and understand how the human genome yeah. works. And the genome is all the genetic information that's in a life form. So this is understanding basically the DNA code yeah. of a human being. And we thought it worked one way, and now they've identified a completely different network of interactions at the genome level. So literally the textbooks are going to have to be written. So it's kind of how exciting things are going on in the world of... And so what we're seeing then, I guess, are experiments that we wouldn't be able to do in the real world that right. we can do in the virtual world of computer simulation. Right. And also um, think about throughput, actually. Some would call this high throughput. 
um, in the good old days, you would study gene X and see how that impacts cancer, right? Mm -hmm. One gene at a time. Now we study all the genes, all 20,000 of them, right? Mm -hmm. And then ask what's each one doing in a particular cancer. So the answer's there because you've saturated all the possible possibilities, and basically now it's just a process of disentangling all the interactions to really understanding why that cancer cell's get growing abnormally. So the students in your lab aren't dealing with test tubes and microscopes, they're dealing with computer terminals yes. and, and video stuff. Well, both. So, oh, both. so we still do hands-on experiments, mm -hmm. but before you get in there and do the experiments, you first get on the computer and try and grab as much information and knowledge as possible, model different situations, and then with much more insight, go into the lab and then try and gather more, more data. And then see if what the computer says will work and actually Exactly, does right, work. right. So you have simulations, you have databases, you have just an incredible repository of information that's out there in the, in the web sphere in terms of being able to access that from any terminal. So it's really kind of changed the way we think about the, 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 the doing of, of biology okay. in the lab. So, so what are students going to do with this, Jim? What are the, the career options open to them? It sounds like it's expanded uh, quite a bit since... Well, it really has. Um, you know, getting your BS degree in, in biology at LaSalle opens up a thousand different career opportunities. Anything from healthcare, physicians, and all the other aspects to, to healthcare. Um, other fields, such as, uh, obviously, teaching, um, biotechnology, um, investments, Wall Street, all that type of stuff. Informatics has gotten to be a big degree, so the bioinformatics program I developed really was a combination between computer science and modern biotechnology to really take students who were conversing and writing code, knew about networks and things like that, but really have them work. They're also scientists, too, mm -hmm. so they knew the language. Um, same thing's true in healthcare now, medical informatics, electronic medical records. You really got to be able to talk both languages. You need to know what the physicians are ta talking about and the healthcare personnel, but then you have to be a computer expert, too. So these are some of the different things that, that the modern biology degree can lead mm -hmm. into. And then, of course, there's all the traditional s careers in science, which are literally thousands. Um, you can be a microbiologist, a marine microbiologist, an agricultural microbiologist, and the list keeps on going and going. Okay. So, there's, so there's so many options available for students. I think one of the challenges is, is what, what are you really good at? Narrowing it. Yes, right now. finding out what, what that one passion that you have, because that's usually where you're going to be successful mm -hmm. and happy. Right. Speaking of passions, uh, before we went on air, you were talking about some of your research and part of your passion, and, and you're, you're looking at horseshoe crabs? Right, right. So I've been studying them for quite a few years. Um, the goal is to study the genome of the horseshoe crab. Uh, that's uh, scientific name is Limulus polyphemus. Uh, we're going to need a couple of hours for me to give the whole, the whole story here. But um, the short thing is that uh, this is a life form that's the only living member of its whole um, class. They've uh, been around for about 450 million years. They've all gone extinct, so they're related. The, the other members of yeah, the other right. members, right? Mm -hmm. So like trilobites and things like that are related uh, life forms, and they've all gone extinct over the years. And this one species has hung on. And when you look at it, it still has a very primitive phenotype. When you look at the genome and the proteins that are present in this life form, they seem to be very primitive. So I think um, while we can't time travel, at least we're getting an animal that's very much like when animals first evolved. Mm -hmm. about half a billion years ago here on the planet. So by studying this life form, we kind of get an idea of, of what it meant to be a very primitive animal way back when. And yet it's just as modern as you and me and the fact that it lives today. Mm -hmm. But it is a survivor. Sometimes we call it living fossil. So that really um, um, strokes my interest in evolution and animal development and diversity and extinctions. And we really have an opportunity to study. And there's many other interesting aspects about the life form too from its blood being used as a pharmaceutical agent. Which is not red. But it's blue, right? Bright blue, right copper-based blood. Um, there's actually companies that extract that blood, uh, get the cells there. They happen to be the most sensitive cells to uh, bacterial contamination. So any drug that gets injected into a human being first has to be tested with horseshoe crab blood to see if it's contaminated, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. is, are they true crabs, Jim? No, they're slicerates. So they're oh, related to spiders, scorpions, and ticks, and that part of the, the arthropod family tree. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That sounds like uh, very interesting. And uh, we see them on the Jersey beaches wash up right. uh, every once in a while. Well, Delaware Bay is the um, highest concentration of the um, animal in the whole world. So there's okay. more horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay than there are any place else. There's a couple other subspecies, the Japanese horseshoe crab and, and the Asian one, which is almost getting extinct. Its breeding grounds have been developed. So 
if the, that one doesn't work, it's going to be around much longer. But there have been some really great efforts by many different individuals to uh, preserve the habitat mm -hmm. of the horseshoe crab in the Jersey and Delaware Shore. They even made a uh, reserve out there in the Delaware Bay where you're not allowed to harvest them. And, and that's really hopefully helped bring up the numbers yeah. back because they were under a little pressure too from overfishing and over exploitation. Okay. And perhaps it's uh, one of those uh, areas where you'll have a field trip and take the students there. Uh, I've done that, that many times, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, Jim, thank you. Okay. My guest has been Dr. Jim Pierce, who is the chair and a professor of biology in the biology department at LaSalle University. Once again, I'm Joe Marbach, the provost at LaSalle. Thank you for joining us.